What is going on guys? Welcome to the Wednesday night live stream. Uh, today we are talking all about carbon. I am far from a carbon expert. So today we have on Brian from Aquachar to kind of dig in and figure out kind of what are the benefits of carbon? Why should we use it? And so Brian, how are you doing? How's it going? Excellent. Thanks. How about yourself? I'm doing great. It's been rainy down here in Jacksonville. Yeah. That happens. Nice, nice today finally, which is a nice change. It's, yesterday was like oddly cold. It's like the first day I've worn jeans yeah. in months, but <laughs> gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> yeah, happens. Yep. So how how did you get into the carbon game? Like, what led you down this path, or how how did you end up here? So what happened was, is I I actually met Ricky, the inventor of Aquachar, mm -hmm. um, about two and a half years ago. Uh, when I met him, he basically showed me what he was doing that was different. So I met him, we exchanged information, and, you know, we just kind of hit it off. And, and little by little, he kind of gave me the layers of what he was actually doing and creating and stuff like that. And I noticed that it was something that was that was kind of different. Um, uh, it kind of combines um, biochar, porosity of trees with uh, activated carbon. So, mm -hmm. uh, but I'll get into that a little bit later. And. Okay. Mostly want to just kind of talk about carbon and the use in the hobby and kind of give a history so people understand how it works. Mm -hmm. I'm kind of curious too. Like I have the vague understanding of you add it to your tank, it absorbs some toxins, you know, makes your water a bit clearer. But aside from that, I mean, I think a lot of us are probably carbon amateurs and have our actual depth of knowledge of it because there's a lot more to it than most of us know or realize. And, and, you know, I was, I was actually, before I met Ricky, I was a lot the same way. You know, I, I kind of had that mentality that, you know, Carbon's carbon, you know, you can't really, um, you know, mess that type of thing up. I actually, I, you know, when I was, uh, you know, like one of my first reef tanks, you know, I bought some cheap stuff to save a couple bucks and, you know, mm -hmm. my tank started getting hole in head lateral line disease and I, you know, stopped using it at that point just because I, I didn't know enough about it. I kind of switched over to good fish husbandry, you know, more water changes, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So is uh, so, is that actually true? Does carbon actually yeah. cause HLLE? Like, is mm -hmm. that true? I've heard that a lot of times. So it's, it's been attributed to it. What I think happened, and I think it, it, it was mostly, you know, the, you know, to, to the late 2000s, that some people were just thinking carbon and they were sourcing the cheap, you know, five gallon buckets of, you know, of, of the cheap China stuff. Mm -hmm. um, some of it can be you know, mm -hmm. carbon. You can do it a lot of different things with it. So sometimes it, just because it's activated carbon doesn't necessarily mean it's good for your tank. Mm -hmm. Okay. Nope, that's fair. A little, little bit choppy, but I think we're doing um, okay. So yeah. one of the things that I, Okay, good, 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 good. I actually, I want to give, uh, I want to start off by giving uh, our buddy Cruz a shout out. You know, mm -hmm. if you guys haven't, you know, heard, you know, he's been very involved in the hobby he does the dino flagit groups i can't tell you how many smart guys i've seen giving like really good advice that says you know cruz has been my mentor um he does mm -hmm. the micro nano bubble and i really like that technology um uh, and he's also a great dad and husband but he has a severe kidney disease he's in need of an a plus kid uh, because of a genetic condition so the, mm -hmm. there's been some fundraisers out there if you happen to know somebody that's willing to give an a plus and he reach out to him, but I just kind of wanted to give a little shout out to him because you know he's been a good friend over our, uh, of mine over the last year. We spent a lot of hours talking about random things. <laughs> yeah, I, I've been down those same rabbit holes with him. So I mean, if you guys do you want to help him out, I did post a thing to. Anyways, his I'll go ahead and start a while back. So, yep. All right, yeah. Brian, all yours. I just kind of want to give him a shout out. That know, let him know that we're all thinking about him because mm -hmm. he's. He's definitely had an impact on the hobby. Yep, definitely. All right, so I'll go ahead and so like I said, if I would have given this talk about mm -hmm. two years ago, two three years ago, my it would be, ladies and gentlemen, carbon's carbon. You know, coming to my talk, um, like I said, I had a little bit of issues with holding head lateral line disease like that, and I come to find out now, it's more about how I was using it, me saving a few bucks on it, um, and. And, and just kind of not using it the right way, and I caused the issues by 
uh, not to, to just kind of understand what the different qualities are and, and, and what, what the base materials were. So um, I want to start off with like a brief history, just how carbon got into the water world. Uh, and its uses, you know, throughout mankind, just because it's always kind of fun. Uh, you know, at, at a show, I usually start it off by saying, "You raise your hand if you're a pyro," because pretty much everybody would raise their hand in that situation. Uh, you know, it's just one of those. You know, the definition of fire in mankind has been one of those like primordials that uh, is just interwoven with humanity. Hmm. Same thing with charcoal. Charcoal has also been kind of one of those things that's been developed. Uh, uh, you know, uh, thirty. You know, it started the bronze age through smelting uh, and being able to make uh, in cast. You know, bronze bronze things at the BCE. You know, the Egyptians started using it for digestion, absorbing odors and stuff like that. Uh, and then, first time they started using it with water, they, uh, the 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 Hindus and Phoenicians discovered it. Uh, There's an antiseptic property with charcoal, so they started using that to purify their water about 400 BCE. So goes a long way back. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if you remember from grade school or you were taught in grade school, but you remember how uh, sailors used to always char the inside of the boat to mm -hmm. keep their water fresh. Uh, so that char barrels w was pretty much fundamental for you know the discovery of the world. They do that in like wine and whiskey barrels too. They try the And then you know, in, in about 1700s, they started really getting into some of the the medical. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty cool. So the next thing they did was they found out that um, you can use it to, to, to deep color solutions. So what they started doing that is uh, there was an English refinery in flour. So that's why when you get a bag of flour, it's white and universal mm -hmm. color. <laughs> um, so that type of in, uh, revolution kind of starts sparking other industries and other looking to it. And, and this is still in the charcoal phase of the time. Uh, by about 1820, they had um, developed the process of doing activate carbon. Uh, on a commercial scale, so this was mostly driven by the need for municipal waters and and and, and medical uses. Um, I actually want to tell a story real quick about about this time frame because um, about 1813 there was a French chemist named Gabriel uh, Bertrand. Uh, he had done a lot of studying with arsenic, and he was giving a, a public lecture in front of a, a, a classroom full of students. And uh, in the middle of the class, he uh, went and put 10 times the league over. The whole class was terrified, thinking he's about ready to die on stage and he's gone crazy. Uh, until the end of the show, when he says, uh, he, he explained to him that he had actually added activated charcoal into, uh, to completely neutralize the effects. And so. This quickly became folklore as far as what activated carbon can do, uh, as far as absorbing things in the uh, things in uh, the body and, and from a medical use standpoint. Uh, yeah. Of course, this demonstration became folklore, and people tried it with different poisons and everything like that. Because I guess even if you live in a lab, it, it's kind of fun to try to defy death. <laughs> These are calculated. Uh, uh, Seems sketchy. Risks. <laughs> yeah. Um, but anyway, so this, once, once something like this came through, yeah, all right. <laughs> um, so this recent, you know, this this kind of sparked a, a research towards the activated carbon side of a side side of the hobby, and um, you know, today one of the number one uses for activated um, carbon is actually with municipal water. So. Mm -hmm. um, it, it was a big deal to get it over to the mass scale of, of things. Um, one of the things that, that they – so I'm going to start off and kind of give kind of a basic of, of carbon in general and you kind of with some, some fun little examples and then I'll uh, – what makes it act and kind of explain what makes it kind of a different molecule. Um, so the first thing is, is uh, you know, the carbon is the sixth element and on the periodic table and it's the most abundant element in the universe and living things. Um, the versatility, the versatility of the actual function actually comes from the fact that it has four um, electrons in its outer ring, where it could actually have eight. Um, so what it does is, best way I've heard it described, like carbon B described, it's kind of like the floozy of the periodic table. It's really to go around and kind of bond with anything, but you know, never gets too attached. Um, 
But what really makes it interesting and what kind of makes the, the, the whole the, the carbon aspect of it is get kind of uh, freaky is when you talk about when you structure the carbon. So I'm going to move my camera back to, to show you guys a little bit of an example on this one to explain how, how carbon is structured in different dimensions and everything like that. So that's the carbon atom. So we've got four on the outside, got a bunch of protons, neutrons in the middle, and two on the inside. Yeah, that's the carbon atom. Yeah, so what makes it interesting is so um, one of the things, while well, this switches back over from my sharing my screen, um, one of the things that makes it interesting is, is um, it can it can form a clear sheet of of um, a two dimensional carbon. So it's basically a honeycomb shape. Mm -hmm. uh, I can show you an example as soon as this video shot pops up. There I go. <laughs> so carbon will build on a two dimensional. Will kind of do like a it has like a honeycomb shape. So mm -hmm. you can do like a two dimensional thing. But what's interesting is uh, to make this stuff. What you do is you have to find something called graphite. What graphite is, is it's, since this is two-dimensional and it has three bonds, there's like a fourth-dimensional plane over the car. So, let's get down show you an example. So, like, if you take this ream of paper right here, and you were to uh, take it in, these are all single layers of, of, of carbon. It's what your pencil lead's made out of. So when you take your pencil lead and you drag it across your paper, piece of paper, you're basically like stripping off and kind of shredding off layers of tan. You know, it's not really consistent. Depends on how hard you press and stuff like that. So that's what you're when you're shredding up the paper. Mm -hmm. You get the heat and the pressure up high enough. Well, well this stuff's a natural so the graphite's mm -hmm. a natural resource that basically is created when a meteorite hits the Earth. So it structures the carbon at a super high temperature, stuff like that. Well, sometimes half of layers will fold onto each other and make a layer, which turns out to be a diamond, which this is just a little fun little project I did with my son. Origami. He's gotten into it lately. Um, so, the two-dimensional layer of, of, of structured carbon with three bonds is a flat sheet like this, uh, and the four-dimensional layer is one of the hardest substances out there for carbon bond. So, um, so going back to the single layer. So, uh, the single layer shows a, a, a different. So I want to tell a story about the single layer of, 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 of graphene. So back in uh, um, 2004, there were two scientists sitting around with um, a, a rock of graphite like this. And they were playing around, and they threw the idea of scotch tape on it. They put a piece of scotch tape on it and pulled off like 10 layers. So then they were playing around, and they said, well, what if we put it there and split it this in half, half again and this in half again? So this was the study of, of, of graphene, which has become a new area of science because it's a, it's a two-dimensional layer of, of carbon. And like I said, it, it has the ability to bond with the carbon, so it sticks together through these layers through an actual uh, magnetic field through the electrons uh, between the layers. Um, so that's just to start us off to explain that, you know, these things, once you break these apart, they have ends to it, and, and, and this is what we, we're going to get into when we talk about activated carbon. So the other type of the type that I want to talk about the most is, uh, is the carbon that they use in the aquarium. So they're basically you're taking out the impurities, the carbons will structure at uh, inside of it. The best way to think about it is if you look inside of your, if you're set, ever sitting inside of a phone. Hey, welcome back. I switched my phone, so we should be a little bit better. Yeah, yeah, it's already better. Perfect. Welcome awesome. back. Yes. 
so, so where where I was was um, I was talking about the type of carbon that we use with activated carbon. So what this is, is it's not structured in any ways like a diamond or, or it's somewhat structured, but uh, what it basically is is you get something like this. Like um, in the middle, it can be structured a little bit, but a lot of like, you know, single carbon bonds, frayed ends and stuff like that. Um, some can be more dense than others, and, and, and I'll get into that in, in a minute. But this is called amorphous carbon, which is basically what you get when you burn anything, and, and, and it's basically the raw material of like charcoal. Uh, it's in activated carbon at that. Um, so burning off these, as the temperature gets higher, it burns off, um, it'll push out those impurities and it'll, inside of here, it'll actually make those two dimensional or three carbon bond, carbon bonds or four dimensional, four, four carbon bonds. So there is structure with inside of, you know, amorphous carbon. It's just not necessarily on a flat plane. Okay. Um, so that's mostly determined by two things. One is the time you can actually keep it, uh, keep the temperature up, and uh, uh, the temperature you bring, you can bring it up to. Uh, mm -hmm. There's an ask point with wood, as everybody knows, and that's where the complications come with uh, uh, in this dance. So I'm going to move on to um, what activates carbon. So. We haven't really talked about it, the impurities that can still be inside of this because what I like, what I said was there's a limitation on temperature. So anytime there's a limitation, you're going to leave be left with some impurities. So uh, you know back when they first started, you know, they used to use charcoal for you know locally wa local water and stuff, but then they switched over to the muni municipal water, which sparked a whole new industry of people de developing you know different types of things and stuff like that with activated carbon. Uh, the medical field is actually considered one of those miracle drugs because, uh, you know, for poisonings and stuff, it, it, 10 grams of activated carbon had the equivalent uh, effect of a kilo of charcoal. So uh, there was a lot of prospect in that. Um, so when you go back to the frizzy ends, um, they all want to bond to something at the end. You know, we're left with little ends of the carbon. Uh, up here that wants to bond with something. So what scientists discovered with activated carbon is they can functionalize it with oxygen. Mm -hmm. So uh, so a adding the oxygen to it is what activates it? Yes. So okay. that, what they're doing is they have, they, there's usually a, and, and this is what makes uh, different activated carbon so much different, you know. Mm -hmm. um, you start with the base materials and, and everything like that. Um, so they'll do things like uh, once they once they get the so I'm gonna go to source carbon now. So source carbon is basically like what made activated carbon so popular was there's an unlimited supply of car carbon sources between you know wood waste you know um, feedstock you know there's plenty of different ways to get a carbon source. That's not the difficult part. What makes activated carbon proprietary is the process to actually activate it and. Um, oxygenate the functional when you functionalize it. Um, so, what happened was is there was an industry where people were able to, where an individual science scientist could use his knowledge to create something, and the companies had the ability to mass produce it and compete that co compete with the rapidly lowering prices as you know more and more options came, became available. Mm -hmm. um, so, but there's was source carbons there's definitely constraints and, and challenges so like i was mentioning earlier um the first and basically the largest and the reason for all the post-production car processing on activated carbon is because um uh, uh is because of the limitation of time and temperature that you could heat it so uh you know the longer your fire runs the more ash you get and the more it breaks down and stuff like that it's kind of the same concept as that only with more complicated machinery. Mm. Um, so, so uh, with that, the, you know, as the temperature goes, there's you're limited to temperature-wise. So what you're left with is you're left with kind of like a pre-smoke residue on the outside of it, mm -hmm. uh, which has like uh, some tars and oils and stuff like that, which are hydrophobic. So when you're trying to interact with water, that hydrophobic stuff doesn't work very well. Um, okay. So. 
So the source carbon, it usually comes in large chunks. So companies will buy it and then they'll break it down and they'll, they'll either take, grind it down into a powder or a flake. That's why you see the sizings that you'll see when you buy different types of carbons. Um, so with a, um, so once they break it down uh, to, the, to the flakes, they have two decisions to do. Uh, it's whether they're going to, uh, or the next step they're going to do is they have like a special etch etching formula that, that basically is um, steamed into it at a high temperature. You know, a lot of people are familiar with this process. If that's what they're actually doing is it's uh, there's an oxidation functionalization type of interaction going in. We're adding that oxygen to the end, so you get that immediate reaction when it hits the water. Okay. Um, hmm. <laughs> I went a little bit deep with it. I I, I, I understand it. <laughs> now, what carbon you can make carbon from different materials as well, right? Correct. So, mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the things. So, I actually found this interesting when I was when I was kind of researching this and stuff. There's one company in the United States that they boast 700 different formulations for different applications for activated carbon uh and then and that's just one company there's actually thousands of processes for individual blends and processes of making it and everything like that that are out there too so it's mm -hmm. been a big industry so one of the things is the, there's a couple different source carbons that are used to make activated carbon um, there's wood there's coconut shells um, fruit bones uh, and then there's fossil coals uh, the most popular one that we, and the one that we use in the in the hobby are are the fossil coals. So, um, so now that we so, basically what happened was is when the inter, when activated carbon was first introduced into the aquarium hobby, uh, there was a quality issue. They started to use the municipal stuff, and the municipal stuff would allow certain things to leach that have a huge impact when you're in a closed loop system, biological system. Mm -hmm. So. They had some issues and processes and stuff like that. I, I actually have a, a, one of my customers showed me an, a tropical fish hobbyist from August 1959 uh, and it explained that uh, when they integrated activated carbon, they were finally able to keep their marine fish alive for months in captivity. Uh, when they added an ion exchange resin as a carbon neutralizer, uh, they were able uh, to prevent osmotic shock is what they believed it was. Uh, they were finally able to keep them alive in captivity for a year or more. <laughs> that's, that's crazy. So car carbon was the secret back 40, 50 years ago. <laughs> that was the original one. And then they found that if they added the resins to take out what the carbon leaches, it actually prevented, you know, some of the, the whole and head lateral line disease issues. Mm -hmm. um, so there's two types of carbon that are used primarily in the hobby today, especially in the saltwater side. Um, it's, Bit luminous and lignant um, coals. Mm -hmm. uh, the lignant coals are, are kind of a brown coal. They're made out of uh, fossilized compressed peat. Mm -hmm. uh, they're considered a low rank carbon. They only have about 20 to 35 percent. But what it does is when they go through the process, they're able to uh, have large uh, have larger porosity, so they can take in some of the heavy metals and larger organics that uh, sometimes uh, other carbons can't do. Uh, so there's a little bit of an advantage to that one, uh, but the most popular one is the the bit the, the bit humus, uh, carbon. It's mm -hmm. a black carbon. It's actually compressed fag fossilized lignite, which is what we were just talking about. <laughs> so um, what this is is it's a there's a tar-like substance on it. It actually is asphalt that we use for the roads. So they rinse that off. They clean it off with burning. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the advantage of this is the carbon's much denser. So it has about a um, carbon content of 60 to 80 percent. Hmm, so what that does is it also lets it, it when the carbon's closer together and compacted like that, like those bonds I was explaining earlier, it's closer together and being able to make it when it's being burnt. Uh, so this allows for super small porosity when they make it. Uh, it's also the reason why most people assume associate um, buying carbon by weight instead of volume which I always thought was funny for something you're trying to talk about porosity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> it, it sounds funny too when you're saying, you know, basically the same stuff they use in the roads. We're like, oh yeah, we keep these tanks all pristine. And you're like, oh yeah, some of that road stuff, let's throw it in the tank. Well, it, it, it sounds it, funny in that perspective. <laughs> it, 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 it's funny when you put it that way. And, and 
I, I, I've talked to uh, companies that make use that type of carbon, and the, the process that goes behind it, it's it, it's super complicated than even what I'm talking about right now. Mm-hmm. So um, the the stuff that's sold in the hobby is pretty safe. Uh, I just pointed it out as it was a as an interesting fact, you know. Um, and then you know, there's been some some debate on the fossil coals or whether it's you know a good why it's the preferred base carbon. But you know, for me, I honestly I think it's actually kind of a cool like one of those forgotten under, underdog stories of mankind. You know, to take coal waste and science and turn it into something that you know the developed world don't even think about the, finding clean water anymore because of this technology. So, mm-hmm. uh, you know, I, I take it for what it is. And that's uh, pretty cool. In that kind of way. Um, so uh, once a company picks their source carbon, they have to decide whether they want to use the flake version, like the bit Luma stuff that you'll kind of mm-hmm. see, you know, in there, or if they wanted to make it into the granulated kind, the GACs. Mm-hmm. Um, so for the GACs, uh, and I, get, I always get asked if I can uniform size aquachar, so I, I figured I'll explain GACs a little bit. So what they do is they take the powder and they kind of um, they'll, they'll heat it up and get those get those um, initial resins and stuff like that off of that. Then what they'll do is they'll find a um, a paste, make a paste out of the out of the carbon, so they can kind of push it through a pelletizer and make it to mm-hmm. universal sizes and stuff like that. Um, so that's how it's made. So it just, I always question the porosity when you're when you're making something a paste. But they also have a have a process where they're heating it up and also taking some of, make increasing some of that porosity also. So they're basically um, compacting it, pushing it through an extruder, and making little chunks of it. Correct. Correct. Okay. And they, which it has its advantage because you know it's fluidized. It's easier to do uh, from that standpoint. It looks pretty. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> Um, so the functionalization process for at least the hobby side of it, I don't, I can't really speak because that's the proprietary, you know, expensive stuff. Um, mm-hmm. What I can say is, is, you know, some use a, a different blends of different source materials and stuff like that to do different things uh, with it um, for a wide range of contaminants in your system. So, uh, but most companies don't actually produce their activated carbon like at, a, at their own personal plant they usually work with one of the larger carbon companies to kind of develop the process and what what blend they feel works with their product line mm-hmm. uh, which you know it makes sense <laughs> yep now earlier too you said that there's you know some companies have like 700 different types of variations of carbon yes. which is kind of crazy i would assume there's you know the handful of you know like the I forget the names, litmus and biomet to whatever yeah. it is. But like, I would assume there's like, you know, four or five different ones, not hundreds and hundreds of different variations. Like as like I mean, a, a novice thought, it's like, how, how much can you really change carbon? Yeah. But, well, what's interesting is, you know, so when they come up with a certain use, they'll find out different ways to functionalize it, to mm-hmm. be able to interact with those certain things. So some of the things that they'll do is they'll functionalize it to be able to take out like a certain type of metal or something like that. So that's where a lot of the things go. Uh, you know, it's it's used in, you know, clean air type of projects and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. So what it is, it's basically the industry demand. Once an industry decides to go that direction with an activated carbon, you've got a ton of companies that have a ton of scientists that are all trying to find the proprietary method to, mm-hmm. uh, to do that. Okay. Um, yeah, makes sense. Yeah. So I want to talk a little bit about um, also, I guess we should move on to like what it does with your water when you put it in there. <laughs> mm-hmm. Okay. So, so that's, that in there. <laughs> yeah. So why, why does someone want to run carbon in their tank? What is the advantage? Right. So I don't know. Uh, so anybody that has a reef tank, you notice, you know, when you push off your water change a little too long, you'll see that watering, that yellow in the watering, you know, mm-hmm. when the lights are off and stuff like that. Uh, what that is, is those are dissolved organic carbons that, um, you know, it's just, waste from your system that's being broken down um those will build up in the water as they're you know uh, as they're released some are soluble that just kind of dissolve into the water some are you know broken down by bacteria and and the oxygenation within the water um uh, and and it also so activated carbon is developed to pull out those contaminants it also briefly becomes a um an ideal environment once it pulls those organics on it for bacteria to live on. Uh, but this is brief because of the size they are, the size it is, and it will get weighed down. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, 
uh, you can kind of see that with fluidizations. Um, now, there's there's a question in the chat that's come up a few times about how long carbon yeah. lasts. And, you know, some people are like, oh, a couple days, you know, some people are weeks. Um, I've always just given like the smell test. If I go smell my tank, it smells oceany. I'm like, all right, maybe it's time to change some. That's my yeah, method. Yeah, but. yeah. So I, actually, that was my next topic. Is I was going to give you some of my advice on how to run carbon and stuff like that. And I okay. want to preface this by saying, if you have a regiment that works for you and you're happy, by all means, keep it going and and and, and, and um, you know do what's working and making your system happy. Mm-hmm. Um, but for me, the best way. Uh, to, to, to run activated carbon is kind of as a um, uh, run it for about one week at a time. It has a very limited lifespan before it's clogged with organics and, and, and can be removed entirely and, and not really having any impact from a, 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 a removal standpoint. It's designed for, uh, like I said, you know, uh, pumping stomachs and, and instant reactants mm-hmm. uh, and uh, which is great for your aquarium because as those things build up, those are getting those dissolved organics build up in your system. Uh, I say find your regimen between water changes on when you should do a week's worth of activated carbon to get your system in line. Uh, one, but once the surface is covered with that mulm, it's it's pretty much uh, done with. Uh, okay. It should be replaced for that. So uh, basically, once it gets that coating, it's not really absorbing anymore. Yeah, the carbon okay. can interact with the water at, at that point. So, okay. and, and, a, and a lot of people will leave it in there longer than that. I do. <laughs> and it's uh, yeah. trust me, I, I did too for a long time, and I just didn't. I didn't realize some of the side effects from that. Now, um, is there downsides to leaving it in too long and just not taking it out, even though you know it's maybe exhausted? You're like, yeah, I'll get to it in like a month. Does it matter? Well, a lot of it's anecdotal and stuff like that, mm-hmm. but I've always heard you, you always hear the stories of like having a nitrate or phosphate leach, and, at a, and the only thing that they had was the carbon, like that they could pinpoint it to, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. What I think happens there is, uh, you know, if you're using a certain type of carbon and it's um, was burned and cleaned on the outside, mm-hmm. it was designed to last that first week. So when you last, it, we put it in your system longer. Salt water is corrosive, so it can start maybe breaking it apart or, or that type of pre-smoke resin can leak in your system. Um, okay. Hmm. Uh, like I was good. saying. Good yeah. to know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so like I said, it was, it was designed for that instant reaction. Um, mm. I do want to talk about the hole in head because you, you kind of, I kind of was touching on it there with the, uh, the, the impurities, the hole in head and mm. lateral line disease. Uh, it was very much attributed to the, the activated carbon. And a lot of people said that it was stripping too much out of the water, which just doesn't make sense to me in a biological system. So for me, what I think was happening was that, you know, uh, the dust that was on the carbon leaves kind of like a that tar-like resin on it. Mm-hmm. And when that's slowly released into your system and built up in your system, it can start affecting the health without necessarily seeing it in your parameters types of things. So kind of like a toxic, the toxicity mm-hmm. can build up in your system for leaving it in too long. Okay, um, good to know. Uh, well, like I said, this is a, these are some of these examples are, are, are old. Uh, the hobby's changed a lot in the last 10 years, and especially with the carbon area, with company, with people realizing that there's a value in buying quality carbon from a reputable company. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a big, um, that's kind of been a big turning point on fixing problems like that. Cause it's not a, it, a issue. You, I remember you used to get on the message boards and hole in head lateral line was a constant topic and uh, you don't see it as often anymore. Mm-hmm. No, nah, no, that's true. Not nearly as common as it used to be. So, um, so yeah, like that's, that's kind of my opinion on the, the hole in head lateral line disease. It's mostly because of, you know, some people will buy low quality carbons to save a buck because they believe carbon's carbon. And that's not always true if they're not necessarily, uh, remember I was saying they're limited to an ash point. So there's always gonna be some of that residue that's gonna not gonna be pushed out yeah. uh, from the system. Uh, so my advice is if you wanna constantly run run it in your system, you know, always have that clarity in your water and everything like that, mm-hmm. is to find that minimum amount that works for your system and just replace it more often. More often, okay. It's, so, you know, everyone wants, 
10 day, once a week to 10 days, you know, <laughs> go out and just put the same amount in and, and don't overdo it. Um, small amounts more often rather than a larger chunk every so often. Correct. correct. Okay. Um, I also, um, you know, I, I touched earlier on some of like, there's um, on, on resins when they added resins into the system. And I wanted to talk about that because there's a lot of carbon resin mixes, all in ones and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So with the technology and the price, if you use proper dosing and, and, and quality carbon, uh, you know, that stuff's not necessarily an issue. Sometimes the resins, like especially the all-in-one resins, can actually throw some, strip some things from your tank that actually do cause some major issues. Mm -hmm. um, especially when you don't know what type of resins they're using or what the amount is. So, uh, you know, it's all technology. If it works for you, it works for you. And, and you know, I don't, I don't really bash anybody yeah. because it, it, it was definitely an innovative product back in the time when it, when it came out. Uh, yep. uh, and the last thing I want to do before I uh, kind of finish it up is I want to talk about um, be a little bit careful of some of the carbons in the industry that kind of have expiration dates on it or mm -hmm. from industries that would have expiration dates on it uh, because the time from when the carbon's fresh to it interacts with air to when it expires, uh, there's a reason there's an expiration date on it. So I don't know if it's a common practice anymore, but I've heard stories about people buying soon to be expired yeah. Uh, specific types of carbon and then rebranding it as their premium grade carbon when they're buying it on pennies on the dollar before it expires. I didn't know carbon expired. Well, <laughs> when you have a medical use and stuff like that, you have to do it. And, yep. and carbon also interacts with air. So mm. it'll pull those contaminants and stuff like that out of air. So um, True. If it's not uh, sealed so, properly. Yeah. It's just something I wanted to point out to people because it's it's something that a lot of people don't realize is uh, finding the a company that has fresh stuff is is you know actually good. But uh, it it hundred percent makes to... sense. I've never thought of that though. Considered it, but hundred percent makes yeah. sense. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I want to conclude just by saying um, you know I know this is a long way to get to this, but when it comes <laughs> to being ran correctly in the hobby, mm -hmm. um, carbon's carbon. So mm -hmm. support the brands that are working with the hobby. Um, if you have questions, reach out to the, the company. Uh, mm -hmm. Most of them are more than happy to explain why they chose their carbons for their specific line mm -hmm. and the blends that they use and everything like that. Um, they spend a lot of time, you know, studying those even more intricacies than I just explained to be able to develop something that you don't have to worry about. So, um, like I said, just reach out to them and talk to them. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Okay, actually, so there's a question around the whole expiry. He goes, what, uh, LG Warrior, would it be prudent if you buy carbon in bulk and vacuum seal your leftovers? Yeah, I mean, honestly, it's yeah. I don't know how much of an impact it really has because air and water are a completely different thing. Mm -hmm. uh, from, it, it's more of um, the freshness of it kind of makes a difference. So, it's, yes, the vacuum sealing it would be a good thing. Uh, I don't know that it's 100% necessary. Uh, so the fresher it is, the more way. effective it is, I guess, basically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. just make sure it's in a closed jar and, you know, you mm -hmm. won't have too much of an issue with that. But uh, okay. it depends on how much you, you're, you're trying to save. Mm -hmm. um, okay, another interesting question. Is there mm -hmm. asking the difference between running like ozone or running charcoal or a carbon? Ozone and carbon? Yeah. Actually, the, it's an interesting combination of the two. Um, you know, they actually work hand in hand. You know, those ozones have a negative charge that will suck in some of those organics from the water. Mm -hmm. uh, not necessarily the same way as a um, as a skimmer would. Mm -hmm. So what it would do is it, it basically, you know, once it interacts with the carbon, it, it, it does have some cleaning aspects when you mm -hmm. run the two together. Okay. Uh, it's just a matter of making sure that you're not overrunning it mm. um, so it, it might be a matter of you know timers and time frames and okay. not I, constantly using it <laughs> I, I run both so that's why i was curious too when he asked i was like ah, i actually do that so yeah yeah no it's it, it's not a bad thing it, but there's mm -hmm. actually it's there's a combination to to the mm -hmm. two mm -hmm. so. nope it makes sense um yeah i mean i run a very low amount of ozone for a few hours a night and then carbon i change it every like four to six weeks maybe kind of is kind of what i personally have been doing yeah 
but yeah mm-hmm. and, well, and that's pretty common in there and and you know it, it doesn't I mean, like I said, what works for you works for you. I just was kind of given some things for people to think yep. about, you know, um, because uh, because they're limited by time and the temperature they can bring it up to. There's always going to be something that they and mm. they do a very good process of removing that between the hydrochloric acid and their 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 um, oxygenation process and everything like that. Uh, mm. But again you, you can't remove everything <laughs> yeah okay so all right so you gave us a pretty good overview of different types of carbon however you have yeah. not even mentioned how you do your own carbon yet because ah, yes. <laughs> all right so what's what's the difference with aquachar and how do you do it compared to all the general ones that you were talking about earlier yeah so we're we're a completely different process and and i'm mm. going to give you kind of a, a, a little bit of a backstory because mm. Um, the history is kind of important on it because it explains where he came, where the inventor came from, and in, mm-hmm. in, in kind of coming up the process. So, um, we took a different approach to it. We um, uh, let me find my spot again. All right, so here we go. So, Aquachar. Uh, so, it was created by uh, Ricky Ricardo. And he was living in Nigeria at the time, and he saw the water crisis firsthand. Um, it's a very complicated issue. So, activated carbon—you know—you can make make it in long, large batches, but you know, even trying to ship it there alone would cost more than to like the village level would cost more than anything else. Mm-hmm. Um, also, because of the shorter lifespan of it. Uh, the maintenance requires a lot of training, testing, and knowledge, which doesn't necessarily exist <laughs> mm-hmm. in some areas. So, um, so he wanted to find a process that he could make a carbon based on locally sourced materials. So biochar, which is is burnt wood in a mm-hmm. low oxygen environment, um, is used for soil and wastewater remediation. Mm-hmm. Um, he, he, it's been, there's been a recent resurgence with organic gardeners and stuff like that from trying to make um, uh, some terra preta soil and stuff like that. But um, so Ricky went out and started researching the biochar guys. He looked at both, talked to both the commercial, commercially made stuff and, you know, some formulas on making his own and, mm-hmm. and, and kind of reformulating it to see if we can get the process going. Um, we actually, you know, um, we were excited because one of them, in the studying of it, we found out that um, uh, around the world that they're actually using biochar at a locally produced level uh, for water purification. Okay. Uh, but after his testing and everything, he found out that this is most likely just being done out of necessity and not ingenuity. Mm-hmm. Um, so there's still that pre-smoke resin that can, can leach the toxins in it. So being who he is, he, uh, he's a very active mind. So he kind of defined the rules and decided to figure out a way to work around them. Mm-hmm. Uh, he became obsessed with, you know, the gap between the theory, theoretical, uh, uses of carbon, uh, and the reality. Mm-hmm. So, um, He wanted to find a solution to those two rules of the time and the temperature before you that you burn your source carbon um, in there. So he started working. He spent two years over there actually working on this. Um, he was working with engineers and developed the chemistry and everything behind that. Um, so he tested it, created his prototypes over there, and realized that he needed to come back and move to America. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, he actually specifically designed the process for America because the source materials that we need are basically either available in other countries, but we can get them as a recycled material here. Mm-hmm. Uh, so well, type of diff- we kept testing it, different types of source carbons, and we couldn't, he couldn't get away from the fact that we, if you can keep the vascular system of wood intact um, uh, with the functionality of activated carbon, you'd have a, um, activated carbon reaction with a biological media. Mm-hmm. So give me one second. I'm going to grab it. Okay. Dun, dun, dun. Yeah, generally, one of the questions which I saw come up was just asking about pellets or grains. Generally, the smaller bits of carbon will absorb more faster because you got more surface area, but then you'll mm-hmm. kind of use it up quicker. 
Welcome back. Yeah, yeah. I'm back. <laughs> All right. So, um, so once I met Ricky, I, I met Ricky about two and a half years ago, um, shortly after he moved back, actually. And you know, me, I was skeptical at first, just given what my knowledge is, was of carbon and stuff like that. You know, I kind of had that carbon's carbon mentality, and and mm-hmm. but when he talked about it was something more than the aquarium industry and you know the situation in Africa, it kind of got with me. So. I started to build a rapport with him and, and, you know, we had conversations back and forth and um, I started to realize that he was a scientist and an inventor and not necessarily a business person. So mm-hmm. I started helping him come up with a plan and, and uh, you know, kind of working on the side with him on, on figuring it out. We started doing testing at a local university and selling at a local fish store just to get some initial reviews and testing and feedback done. Um, uh, and making tweaks to the process along the way to make sure the product was better. Um, so, actually, uh, back in October 2018, I uh, had one of those really, really bad weeks. So I uh, got let go of my job after 13 years. And when I told Ricky this, he said, "Well, that's great news. Let's start working on mass production." <laughs> Wasn't necessarily what I needed to hear right then, but it was. Mm-hmm. Um, then a week later, I actually went to Dallas for a football game. And uh, I was running back to my hotel room and had the right away, and I got hit by a car. So I had to have surgery. On my, I had that surgery on my 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 bicep and my labrum, my shoulder and the labrum of my hip, and my back uh, is still messed up from it. But um, when I told him about the accident, he said, "All right, I'm going to work in mass production, and when you're healed, we'll launch the product." So we kind of put a little bit of perspective on the, on, on the thing. So this is how I kind of got involved with Aquachart because, you know, I kind of needed a kick in my pants to kind of make, like I knew he was designing something interesting and, and, and had good uses, but um, he needed some help with it. So um, we, built, we built the tub and, and he eventually, you know, told me that he wants me to run the company for him. So... We launched the product in April of 2019, uh, and people ask me, you know, all the time, why are they aquarium hobby? Because there's a lot of uses and, and stuff like that for it. Uh, and I always say, you know, first of all, it's my hobby. Um, mm-hmm. I've made good friends all over the world in this hobby, and and um, you know, it's it's always fun when you can kind of work in your own hobby, and, and it makes me happy with my product. You know, people could reach mm-hmm. out to me. He's like, I'm so happy with my tank, like. You know, I was ready to shut it down. You know, those types of stories kind of put a smile on my face. Mm-hmm. Um, nice. The second one is because the process of making aquachar is a lot longer and a lot more labor intensive than something like activated carbon. So we needed to find an industry where we can sell it in base units mm-hmm. and uh, uh, and where people actually do the testing and long-term use reviews to see that it's worth it, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, uh, and the last reason is honestly because as soon as we say that it were wood based carbon, we had to differentiate ourselves from biochar. So, water purification has been like the dream market for the biochar industry for decades now. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's been millions of dollars invested into some very smart people to uh, try to think, find a solution, and it was um, to no avail. So, um, we just wanted to, we, we figured what better way for us to prove that we're something different than throwing our carbon and our charcoal into a bunch of tanks with a bunch of really, really expensive fish. <laughs> yeah. Corals. Okay. There, um, there is a question about on it. About, yes. you, since you're kind of talking about the process, this one that was a, a few minutes ago. He goes, how do you heat the aquachar so hot since steel melts at 2000 degrees? Um, it's... Uh, it, it, it's a combination between the chemistry and the um, machine that we use. Mm-hmm. So it's not necessarily. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more of that in, in a minute. I, I'll, I'll get mm-hmm. to that and explain kind of more about the process and what makes it different. Okay. Um, so, um, so we went to, when we introduced the project, we, we kind of went off the natural alternative to activated carbon. You know, just because when you start in the industry, if you say you're a carbon product, people have a certain expectation. You know, they want mm-hmm. clear water. And we knew that was at least something that we did for a lot longer than the lifespan of, uh, of most uh, activated carbons. Mm-hmm. So um, um, 
we also, you know, we also had an emphasis on, you know, the long term, the long term biological aspect and the pH stability for it. Mm -hmm. um, so we we kind of went along with that, and and you know, it, we, part of the reason we did that was because you know we didn't want to seem disingenuous to really get down into the process because we got to keep some of the proprietary stuff in there. So we kind of left some, you know, what you call Easter eggs out there for customers to discover and and, and stuff like that. Um, which was kind of cool because it, 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 I don't know if people paid attention to a lot of the conversation, but it started on an honest conversation and it was, it was, it was fun. Um, so to answer the question, what makes Aquachar different? So, uh, we make Aquachar at, um, uh, once we start the fire that we have a 13 step process that we, we go through, um, that lasts for almost 24 hours. So once we, so once we're done and we use a steam-based cool-down process, mm -hmm. um, that's our final product. So the only other thing that we do after that point is we, we, we dry it, we sift it, and we do some quality control on it. Uh, so there's no big, long post-production. There's no acids to do it, and no limited of temperature and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so not only do we bring it well beyond its normal ash point, um, we also have to maintain this temperature because if, if the oxygen gets in there, it rapidly eats away at the reaction we're trying to create. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay, the whole um, low oxygen thing makes sense now. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the end result is actually a, a larger format um, lump char uh, charcoal. So mm -hmm. uh, it's a, it's a natural size. You can see the natural porosity of the wood still kept intact, uh, and it's not necessarily the the, the smaller granular size like you see with activated carbon mm -hmm. and stuff like that. Um, uh, the sizing is, is unique. The, the temperature is what makes the sizing unique because, you know, we got a lot of people that were in the carbon industry that said that they'd never put something as large as Aquachar in their system because there's no way that it's not leaching. Uh, just because they didn't understand that the temperature limitations they were living with it. Um, mm -hmm. We, we've since then had actually two ICP companies from MACNA do testing, you know, 30, 60, 90 days apart to see that there was no leaching in there. Mm -hmm. um, so, like I mentioned with the amorphous carbon. Uh, um, so, the, the, okay, go ahead. Quick question. Why would the size of it be relative to leaching versus a small one or a big one? Like if it had something in it, regardless of the size, so, wouldn't it still leach? So when, it, when the, the, the idea is that the, the larger one can't get that internal temperature up to structure the carbon and push out the impurities. Okay. So uh, what we're doing is, like I was saying, the carbon will structure into these carbon-carbon bonds. And as it's doing that, that's what pushes out the gas that you'll see, like the blue flame of, of, of come out of your fire and stuff like that. Um, that's from the carbon structuring internally from the temperature that it's being brought up to. Okay. Okay. No, that makes more sense now. Okay. I understand why now. Yeah, so what happens is, is, is since we bring the temperature up so high, we get a lot more of those carbon-carbon bonds. We're also working with a natural cellulose structure, so we were able to build off of the nature. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that kind of like the internal porosity of the wood, more or less, as it's being, it's, so it's keeping it not necessarily disintegrating or breaking it down. Yes, yeah. It, okay. It's a matter of keeping it from from breaking down and and and, and basically turning to ash, you know, in, in, mm -hmm. in the small size standpoints. Okay. Um, yeah. So since our project process doesn't have the multiple rounds of the burning, acidification, and et etching, mm -hmm. um, Aquachar has a fibrous material that's on the outside of it. So all those fibers that keep a tree from growing up, mm -hmm. those are still. Coming from a porosity and, and layered standpoint. Um, hmm. uh, another unique thing about our process is how we functionalize it. So uh, like I said, I don't know much about the functionalization process on um, the carbons in the hobby, but um, what we're able to do with our larger size is we're able to take the carbon and use the carbon in chemistry to kind of functionalize it to where it has stored hydroxides or they're actually oxides that convert to hydroxides in water, but uh, I won't get back to that. <laughs> but it still releases those hydroxides into your system. So 
I was actually talking to my buddy Cruz about this and telling him I was having a hard time explaining it. And if you ever talk to him, he's like the acronym king. So like you tell him, you tell him about a subject and he'll be like, oh yeah, we called it this back in the day. And he'll explain a whole subject in four letters. <laughs> Sounds right. <laughs> so he came up with um, um, a good way of describing uh, the, the process of, of uh, as BAMs, it's called bacteria, uh, biologically active microsites. Mm -hmm. uh, so the larger size allows it to have a more diversity of bacteria on it. Uh, kind mm -hmm. of think of it like uh, New York City high rise versus where the diversity. Mm -hmm. so actually, um, someone some in the chat actually had like a decent point here, which kind of he's like, gotcha. So what? So the carbon eventually becomes marine pure. Cool idea. So that actually is a good summary, well, right? So it's funny. I was talking to some of the, mm -hmm. the guys that have blocks like that, and yeah. I was explaining. I was explaining the negative charge and stuff like that with with aquachar, and they're like, they're, these are all characteristics we we look for in our marine port pure box. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's a, it's, it's funny that somebody brings that up because I thought that was mm -hmm. a curiosity because it has the same type of promotion of the you know aerobic bacteria. So, so okay, and I have a question. Now, yeah. if it becomes basically a, a porous surface area for bacteria. Yes. A af after it's done doing all its carbon, if you never removed it, was there any risk of it potentially leaching stuff? If you just kept adding, you're like, oh, I'm just building up my bacteria space. <laughs> you know, or it's funny. One of my favorite things is people will open up. What it does is the pods in the system decide that they're going to be lazy too. So they just start eating the bacteria with their bellies full of processed food. And mm -hmm. I, I've had so many customers reach out to me after the fact saying, oh, yeah, I just removed this after four months. And look at all these pods and the life growing and on, growing mm -hmm. on top of it. Uh, you know, I've had customers say, like, this works better than my pod motel and stuff like that. So uh, mm -hmm. what it is is that bacteria can become, you know, uh, food for, for, for your microfauna and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, so anyways, I was going back to... There's an aquachar has a negative charge to it. So the, the hydroxides on it creates a, a negative charge that what we do is we actually pull those fine organics from the water that catches your light. So a lot of people who even use activated carbon, they'll use ours and wake up the next morning and be like, wow, it looks like it's 4K just because the light's not pulling, the, like catching those organics in the water. Mm -hmm. um, so it'll magnetically pull those fine organics out of the water. Um, and it's also the larger size, the chunk version of it. When you run it in a reactor, it does it allows it not to clog and it allows the flow to keep continuing to go through for months at a time. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually did run it in a reactor. So that's kind of how I yeah. had it in like a little nice reactor because I, I did try some a few months back. So okay, yeah, yeah, yep. awesome. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. it's um, it, 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 it's a little bit of a unique carbon. So. Um, so basically what it does is also like like i was telling you earlier it acts as, you know with those bands it acts, it acts as a biological catalyst so um the carbon alone is not what attracts the bacteria what attracts the bacteria is the mulm and the and the fine organics that get attracted to the outside of it because that's what the bacteria wants to eat so mm -hmm. um this is this is the point where I'm at a show and I, I have to kind of do like a look over my shoulder to make sure there aren't any kids around. <laughs> but I jokingly mm -hmm. tell people, I say, <laughs> you know, bacteria is just like is 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 lazy, just like I am. Uh, they only want to eat and reproduce. <laughs> mm -hmm. So what we're creating is we're creating an environment where it's pulling in those natural organics directly to where they're living. Mm -hmm. So and the porosity, the additional porosity and stuff, provides them with a protection for the young. Mm -hmm. So um, when, when you combine that together, the food being pulled from the water basically creates that bio, that those BAMs. Um, okay, there, there's so, a question, question here yes. from Coral Lovers. Is there a difference in using it in a carbon reactor or just a bag of carbon in some high flow area? Uh, there's a minor difference. It's not really worth fretting about the ability to adjust flow and stuff like that in a reactor is a benefit but i i i haven't had anything any anyone have any real issues with uh you know it's it's marginal difference at best mm -hmm. um the the good thing of running it about a, in a bag is it's a lot easier to 
go and rinse it off once a month and get some of those larger organics and, and, and mature bacteria mm -hmm. off of them to allow the younger bacteria to repopulate it. So if you take it, you're doing your maintenance on your tank, you could take mm -hmm. it out, rinse it off, get off that kind of bacteria film, and then you're still going to get more life out of it. Correct. Yes. Nice. Okay, that's cool. Yeah, and it, it, it allows it for, the, especially when you do that when you're adding a little bit extra in there, mm -hmm. um, it allows that you to keep, keep your bacteria source as it's growing, and it'll grow on the additional um, space. Mm -hmm. Nice. It's hmm. kind of a cool so, advantage. Yeah, and well, so I want to kind of explain a little bit about, you know, most people just kind of, you know, once their tank cycle, they don't really think about bacteria that much. But I kind of wanted to like explain a little bit about, you know, how it works with aquachar. So um, a mi what a microsite is, is it's basically a place where it can either be a piece of organics in the system that's going to be broken down completely, or it can be a place where there's a lot of diversity, where the young bacteria grows, matures, then goes out and tries to find its own little home somewhere in the system. Um, mm -hmm. This is one of the issues I have with skimmers sometimes is because sometimes people over skim and they don't realize that not just pulling protein out of your system, you're pulling a lot of that bacteria that's balanced that's out of your system also. So um, that's just a little side note. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. A other quick questions. So would you rinse an yeah. RO or would you rinse it like in the sink or tank water? What would you rinse it in? Uh, it, it doesn't make a difference. Uh, okay. You you can you can use you know whatever you feel comfortable with with your system. Um, mm -hmm. I, know, I know a lot of people have the RO need and everything like that, but we've never really had the um, issues with washing with anything else because it's got the porosity and it absorbs a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Rinsing it with sink water, you're not you're gonna have minimal impact for that couple okay. minutes anyway. <laughs> All right. When um. When I first started reefing, I'm always like, as I'm rinsing my carbon, just get all like the dusty yeah. fines off. I was like, am I wasting my carbon? Is it absorbing all my tap water? <laughs> no, trust me. I, 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 I know. It's funny. But I remember back in the day, that always crossed my mind when I was rinsing it and get all the little dusty bits off. Um, yes. Mm -hmm. um, so one thing I want to talk about is pH and hydroxides because, mm -hmm. you know, that's one of the things that we, we, we were talking about um, that, that we advertise and stuff like that. So mm -hmm. the combination of deep porosity for the anaerobic bacteria to kind of, you know, pull the pull, pull what they need in and from the surface and, and survive uh, along with the hydroxides, which provide your nitrifying aerobic bacteria with uh, what it needs to kind of convert your nitrogen cycle. Mm -hmm. um, it, it, it's, it provides a, a diversity in one place and, and um, as it builds up, it kind of finds a balance in the, in the chemistry. So, um, so I was talking about how we, we, we slow release those hydroxides into the system. So, mm -hmm. um, well, it's not our mechanism. So a lot of people are familiar with hydroxides from, from Kalkwasser. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they, it, uh, to, to, they use it to raise your pH and everything. Yeah, yep. other benefits. Um, we slow re the slow release of our hydroxides. You know, at first will will neutralize. It's designed to neutralize like the respiratory CO two buildup, the carbonic acid that'll get into your system when your lights go off at night. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of reduces the minimum. So a lot of customers who get stuck in that seven eight eight point oh range. Um, They've told us that they, they'll end up getting to above that 8.1 to 8.4 range that they always kind of, you know, wish they could get to. Uh, mm -hmm. It's not always exact. So um, what, when it's initial, during the initial colonization, um, it'll, it'll start, those hydroxides will be built, used to build up and kind of address your nitrogen cycle and kind of build up the bacteria base. Then it'll go into absorbing the CO2 being released by the bacteria that's on the carbon. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and after that, it'll start, once it finds that balance, it can start leaching hydroxides into your system on a daily basis mm -hmm. to where, um, so it could take a couple of weeks to actually see the pH change to take into effect because the bacteria will be neutralizing that right away. Reese Girl mm -hmm. actually had a really good video on this where she, uh, she had put it in her system and noticed the other benefits, but didn't see the pH change. And then, um, you know, 
uh, came back and, and checked her pH a couple weeks later, and I think three or a month later, and she noticed that it was finally up there to that 8.2, yeah. 8.2 range. Nice. I did so. not get that high. Um, I also have a calcium reactor, so I always have that little bit of a pH battle. And so, and, and that's part of the problem with the calcium yeah. reactor. It's very yeah. hard with, with with CO2 and the balance. And like I said, it's mm -hmm. slow release, but it's only can it, it's it only releases a certain amount in there. So, um, mm -hmm. so yeah. So let me go get to dosing um, yeah. with it. So um, with Aquachar, what we do is we have we sell it by the cup or two cups and mm -hmm. that range so about 250 milliliters for you guys up there <laughs> um and then 50 50 gallon tanks about, uh, per 50 gallons so of water volume uh it usually works for three to six months just really depending on your bio load and and mm -hmm. um, uh, how often you really want to replace it um like it's, I said, ripping it off, some of the larger organics will extend some of the extend the life, uh, you know, in, in some of the reactions that you see. Is there any advantage or disadvantage to adding more than that? If you say, yeah, let's double that. Is it going to last longer? Is it going to not make a big it, difference? It will or will... Yes, it will last okay. longer. So it's more about what the base is on your on your aquarium and how much your inputs are and everything like that, you know. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we have had instances where people run super low, you know, nitrates, phosphate system that yeah. you didn't have very much inputs going into it. And they saw, you know, uh, zero, zero out, you know, the dreaded yeah. zero, zero. <laughs> and, um, and the only thing that we could really attribute to it, if it was the aquachar, was the, just the, the, the bacteria consumption of those fine organics mm -hmm. um, that would neutralize out anyways. So, um, that's crazy. All these like side kind of benefits that you don't wouldn't think of. Well, and 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 like I said, I, I with the temperature we're doing, and we're actually using some chemistry within you know building the materials, so mm -hmm. uh, we're able to do some 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 different things with uh, a, a natural environment mm -hmm. uh, versus you know just trying to oxygenate it like uh, activated carbon. Um, mm -hmm. So I wanted to tell. So we we we'd mentioned you know how to how to put it in your system. So the mesh bag and the the sumps are are and the reactors are both uh, good ways of running it. Like I said, there's a little bit minimum return, but I also want to kind of do a explain a dosing schedule because I've had a couple of the maintenance companies you know separately tell me how they're doing it uh, because you know they're there every you know once a month or a couple of weeks or something like mm -hmm. that, so they don't really have as much control. So um, uh, what they're saying is, is uh, they're seeing a really good reaction from their clients because they'll, they'll start with a half dose or a full dose for the, the, the system, and mm -hmm. then every one to two months, they'll add on a, um, a half dose to the system to build it up. Mm -hmm. So what that does is it keeps that initial you know, uh, hydroxide reaction balance in your system kind of building off of each other and keeping it stable in your system. You know, Obviously, once, once you're filled up, you can decide... Um, the way I always kind of describe it was uh, you, you can kind of think of it as like a live rock that you can rinse off, clean, remove easily in your system mm -hmm. uh, uh, for that standpoint. Okay. <laughs> Lord Mills, is this stuff better than what I use them to barbecue in the grill? Okay. So char charcoal mm -hmm. is prior to turning into carbon. So that that's early mm -hmm. in the process. So that, that was that's one of the interesting things. So, mm -hmm. uh, and, and the way I kind of structured this was I explained, you know, they started off with charcoal and that was the thing that they used for a long time. And then they found out the activated carbon side was working. Um, and man kind of stopped using fire once we got electricity. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, um, so, so yeah, so this is, this is a lot different. Um, you know, it's, uh, a, Charcoal that you're doing that you buy for your grill never gets above 250 degrees Celsius, mm -hmm. whereas we're getting up to about 2,000 degrees Celsius or sometimes more. So, mm -hmm. okay, okay. Another question in the chat: How does it affect dosing of aminos or things like AB plus? Um, so, would the carbon absorb any of that type of dosing stuff that you're adding to your tank? Um, uh, from a from a it really depends on the on, on the brand of aminos and how quickly you're running it and how much you're putting in there. It, the mm -hmm. bacteria will eat the excess aminos in the system, mm -hmm. uh, regardless of whether you have aquachar or anything like that. It's just uh, 
uh, part of the nature. But I think a lot of people are using the aminos for target feeding and stuff like that. So, um, so actually, it that's doesn't, a... it doesn't affect. The, the, I mean, the aminos that you dose isn't in, in your system for a long period of time. <laughs> so on that side thought, it might be more beneficial if you have, say, your carbon reactor and do your dosing downstream of it so it doesn't get sucked in right away. That way it has time to dwell in your tank before it passes through. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, and like I said, it's, it's one of those things that we haven't seen any any negative effects with that. We have plenty of customers mm -hmm. that, are, that are doing the, running the aminos and everything like that and seeing great results. Mm -hmm. uh, so it, we haven't had any issues with aminos on that side of it. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of stuff, and again, what I, like I said earlier, we're taking in um, positively charged um, particles in the water. So if it's neutrally charged or, or, or have, has a negative charge, it doesn't interact with aquachar. So some of the bacteria, you know, they'll break things down into biologically neutrally charged nutrients that your system can break, you know, actually consume mm -hmm. uh, in your system. So uh, crazy. It's interesting, the whole like negatively and po positively charged, you know, and like which ones it kind of targets in a weird way. Oh yeah, yeah. it's it, well, and, and it's interesting, but most of the um, most of the things that we dose in the in the hobby today are usually neutrally charged, anyways, because um, mm -hmm. they're small based, and that's basically what they're doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, so they don't have any they don't have any really really um, strong charge either way. Mm -hmm. Um. um... Noop sick USA. Instead of cleaning in fresh water or salt water, you can just shake the bag really hard in the sump to like get off that like mullum build up on it. <laughs> we I, we I've had a, a bunch of customers because they they'll open it up and they'll see all the pods that are on crawling all over it mm -hmm. that they're just like I can't not get rid of this. I'll just let I'll just let the new dose suck in all this all, all the stuff I'm putting in my tank. Nice. <laughs> surface so, area. There you go. Bacteria so, surface yeah. area. Yeah, it's it, well, and, and like I said, it's a little bit of a different product. Uh, mm -hmm. um, no, it's a it's a whole new load of carbon information that I've never considered or had any idea about. So, well, and, and, just, and, and honestly, that's what I wanted to kind of mm -hmm. you know sit down and explain. And I want to explain the whole process so people can figure out what works for their system, what they want to do, if they want mm -hmm. if they're looking for a specific quick reaction, you know, activated carbons are great for that, you know, removing mm -hmm. medications and stuff like that, use activated carbon, like Aquachar can do that, but it's mm -hmm. not the ideal use for it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you don't want that sitting inside of your biological area, you know? <laughs> yeah, no, for, for sure. Kind of long -term type of thing. No, that's so, awesome. Um, what else? Was there any other questions I didn't ask yet? I copied and pasted a few, I'm just making sure I covered them all. I yeah. think, yeah, I think we got them all. Uh, yeah. Perfect. Uh, is there any effect on ORP? That was the one that was asked earlier. What's that? No, it does not have nope. any effect. Well, if anything, it's, it, we, we got some preliminary testing and some people that are really curious on that aspect of it, but I don't really mm -hmm. feel comfortable really giving. <laughs> Still too early. Okay. Anecdotal type of stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, from that standpoint but but there's no negative effects you know uh, you have an issue like you know i don't know how many people know this but you know the orp can be affected just by putting food into your water so <laughs> yep sure does let's go every time i feed <laughs> tanks exactly so i mean it, it's it, it it doesn't have any impacts like that <laughs> mm -hmm. okay perfect awesome well thanks for coming on and enlightening us on carbon today hey. yeah one thing i one thing i did want to mm -hmm. mention was um uh, so we are, when we were originally introduced that we actually you know, our, our our price was twenty dollars for the fifty gallon bag worth so mm -hmm. um you know we had a lot of success in the last year you know um we set up distribution with brian aquatic distributors up in canada mm -hmm. uh we have international packaging and distribution out of holland uh we introduced at sips uh, the chinese international pet show back in november mm -hmm. um and we're in 20 countries and growing at this point. Nice. Um, but one thing we did was we decided, you know, during this year, since we've been able, we've been successful and supported by the hobby, we, we nearly doubled the amount that you get for that old price, just nice. to make it more affordable for the hobbyist that wants to use a little extra, just kind of, you know, awesome. enjoys it. So uh, we started that at the beginning of the, at the beginning of the year. Nice. 
Good to hear. More more carbon for your bucks always a good thing. <laughs> Well, you know, it, it, like I said, it was it was a process that we had a lot of uncertainties going into into the first year. So we just kind mm -hmm. of it, it's it's a lot easier to to break it down than it is up. So once we figured out the machinery and we're able to figure some stuff out, we were like, well, it's time to, it's it's time to get it to more hobbyists. So yeah, no, nope, very cool. Yeah, no, originally saw it at Macna way back when and i'm not gonna I lie when i first saw it, i'm like whoo that's pricey for that tiny bag so now that you get double of it that's good yeah, uh, yeah. and we mm -hmm. understood that and, and and like i said it was it, it was difficult when you're trying to explain something that you're prepared against mm -hmm. something that's not changed regularly that you get by the gallon versus something that's more of a biological long-lasting thing so mm -hmm. um but yeah, you know, it's, it's funny you mentioned Magna because, you know, how Magna came along and we had those um, Hurricane Dorian came through mm -hmm. and a lot of things. So we had done 3,200 samples uh, mm -hmm. for Magna. And since there wasn't that many people that showed up, we had a bunch of extras. So <laughs> we, like I said, we, 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 we started off in Nigeria and we decided to ship it back to Nigeria and let our partner try to find an industry. And he, he ended up hooking up with catfish farming in Nigeria. Um, because it's the number one way of producing protein for people there because mm -hmm. <laughs> you can have two kilos in nine months <laughs> yeah it's a good chunk so, of catfish uh, it's been interesting experience so, you never know where the the plan's gonna go so catfish farming they're using it just to clean the water that the catfish are in yeah so it's funny the mm -hmm. first guy that we talked to he was an israeli water expert and mm. he was trucking in from the nearest city 10,000 liters a day to do his water changes for his first a day? hatchling. A day to Ooh. do his hatchlings. Mm. <laughs> like they just brought it every day to, from, the, from the nearest city. Um, four months earlier, he had drilled a well, and he pretty much did testing and found it was unusable. Mm. So he switched over to the Aquachar system, and he's, he's been running it for, I think, eight months now. Uh, mm -hmm. On that, raising his raising his hatchlings and stuff like that, and he's doubled or tripled his his production from what he used to get just by having clean water. Nice. Um, so, does he it, still it, truck it, in it, all this water every day? What's that? Does he still truck in all this water every day? No, he, he was able to use his wellhead with the aquachar system. Oh, so just use... to clean the water that he had instead of bringing it in. Huh, crazy. Well, he was having a big iron issue and, and mm -hmm. with new hatchlings. Iron's a huge issue. So we were able to recycle it a couple of times to make it where. Uh oh, turned out the video. Lost ya. So catfish farming to water filters to medical to not dying of arsenic. I don't know if you guys heard that when we first started, but um, wit one of the one crazy things was around. Oh, one sec, it's called me back, I think. With, um, ba -ba 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 -ba. was eating arsenic with uh, carbon. This is like way back in the day, like on Aquachar, which is general carbon. It actually neutralized it. And the guy would normally have bit the dust. Kind of crazy. Um, so a few people were, were asking earlier about the difference in running carbon versus an ozone. Um, so I do do both my tank. I run ozone nightly, and I run that for about four or five hours a night at very low amount. I do it mainly for water clarity. Um, ozone is really good at breaking down those yellowing pigments and those organics in the water. Um, now, the bigger difference, I know it can break down some toxins and some things, and where carbon would do a bit of a better job sucking out some of like the toxins from say if you had like leather corals or different things in your water and the carbon would suck a lot of that stuff so welcome back sorry my phone died <laughs> ah yes no problem oh you're back me? yeah i can hear you um yeah was there any other points that we missed or that we want to cover or? all right cool died. Perfect. No, if nobody has any questions, I mean, I, uh, yeah. Cover the basis. Well, I appreciate you coming on today and enlightening us on. Thank you for having me on. I, I know it was long-winded and it was a lot of information, but mm -hmm. hopefully people learn from stuff. No, exactly. 
So when are you going to be back at the trade shows once they start back up again? Yeah. If anybody yep. has any questions, feel free to reach out to me. I'm always more than willing. And where do people find you if they want to ask you questions? Oh, I can't wait for the trade shows to come back around. Yeah. Um, just through your website, Facebook. What's the best way for someone uh, to reach out? They can out? go to the Aquachar page on Facebook or find me, Brian. Perfect. Awesome. Well, thanks again, Brian. Appreciate you coming Facebook on. Facebook and... or um, they can mm -hmm. find me on Facebook personal or they can find me. Okay, perfect. Awesome. Thanks again for Thank coming you. on. Thanks. All right, guys. Hopefully you guys learned something about carbon today. Um, yeah, if you enjoyed it, hit that thumbs up. Sorry, the audio with the connection is a bit choppy on his side on the beginning. Cell phone definitely fixed that one. But yeah, I definitely had no idea like prior to today what's the difference in car carbon versus activated carbon and all the different things and different types about it. So yeah, kind of interesting, kind of cool to know. Um, have tried out the Aquachar myself for a while. Um, I didn't necessarily get a big pH jump in that, probably because the calcium reactor. I did find it did last longer though couple different things so I have to give her another whirl and see how she goes and if you guys have not done so yet we are having the 25k whoop, whoop, uh, giveaway for an Elkatronic and if you guys haven't entered yet get in there and the original video I said it was just Canon US pulled a few strings made a bit of a deal there and now it is opened up to anyone in the world I don't care where you are but if you're outside of Canon US then you got to pay for shipping and if you have a different power adapter, if you're in like Europe or Australia or somewhere with a different plug, you might be on, have to find your own power adapter, but it just runs at 12 volts of so whatever the amps is, so you should be able to find a power adapter. So you guys can enter too. I always feel bad for people like, what about us? So everyone's included, but a few caveats here outside of Canada, North America. So get in there and yeah. All right, guys, going to call it for today. It's been an hour and a half, so hopefully you guys enjoyed it and I will see you guys on next week's stream.